Okay, here's my disclaimer slide. I'm Evan Strowis. I'm a colorectal surgeon out of Denver, Colorado with over 700 colectomies under my belt. Today's course is incorporating robotics into everyday practice, how to achieve better results. Basically, that's how do we reduce complications, make our lives easier, have our patients' lives be easier. How do we optimize workflow in the OR? And finally, how do we achieve a 97% robotic rate? That's doing difficult cases robotically. So first, if you look at my data here, which was data collected over an 18 month period, you see that I have a short length of stay of about three days, no conversions, no surgical site infections, and no readmissions. Uh, also on this data collected from one of my two hospitals, you saw no mortality, no transfusions, all in that 18 month uh, period. Uh, this has uh, resulted in a high volume uh, caseload of 65, sometimes per quarter. Uh, how do we do that? Well, we have to be efficient. Here's my robotic coordinator discussing it. Since a number of months ago, Dr. Strobos had five cases booked on for one day, and we were able to flip him between both of our robot rooms and able to keep the day moving and was able to shave almost three hours off of his day. Okay, so that was about getting our speed back robotically. So it does happen. Uh, we do do five uh, robotic cases, colectomies in a day. Um, what I'm now talking about is really what makes our life truly easier, and that is reducing complications for our patients. When our patients don't have complications, they go home sooner, and we just don't have the stress. Uh, that's really the most stressful for, thing for me as a surgeon. So this is the Wexner article, which talks about intracorporeal versus extracorporeal anastomoses. And obviously what it shows is that we're having reduced anastomotic leaks, reduced surgical site infections, and reduced incisional hernias when we do intracorporeal anastomoses instead of extracorporeal anastomoses. And while people can do intracorporeal anastomoses, laparoscopically uh, clearly if you look at the data that is far more often done robotically because it's just uh, so much easier to do uh, this next article is uh, an Italian one and there's also a Japanese one which uh, has an even uh, greater number of, of patients within it and what that article is showing is that we have better uh, sexual function and better TME excisions when we do low interior sections robotically instead of laparoscopically. And obviously that makes sense because when we're operating robotically, we're always looking at nerves. We're always debating which nerve this is, which nerve that is. Uh, and so the fact that we see these nerves and are putting them to the side, uh, it would make sense that we're having uh, less nerve injuries. So between these two articles, uh, when you're talking about uh, less anastomotic leaks, less nerve injuries, less surgical site infections, um, less hernias. I mean, these are all the things that make common sense to us that are actually uh, happening in uh, robotic surgery. Okay, so for our first video, here's the rectum being pulled out uh, from below. This is an APR. Um, uh, robotically, I will go uh, down through the levator floor uh, from above. Um, I find that dissection a lot easier. Um, when I go then below, there's very little I have to do. But what this video is really about is it's about uh, what I'm doing right here, which is cl closing the levator floor uh, from above. Uh, when you try to close the levator floor from below, um, as I'm sure we've all experienced, it can be uh, very difficult. You, you're not sure, uh, it's very hard to see. You're not sure if you're truly getting good bites of the muscle. And then we often have uh, complications from that. Um, so uh, a different approach, uh, an approach from above, you can see nice solid bites. Uh, into that uh, levator floor uh, and, and a very good closure. Uh, so very happy uh, with this as far as uh, reducing complications on APRs. Okay, so while this video is running and we're watching this closure, I was also just going to talk a little bit about myself because it was asked, you know, uh, how I trained and how I got into this. So basically, I was a resident at Abington Jefferson uh, in Abington, Pennsylvania, uh, with five uh, colorectal surgeons who were really good at the minimally invasive surgery. Uh, and so we got a lot of experience, and I came out of there pretty much as a, a pretty slick laparoscopic, straight laparoscopic surgeon already. I then did my fellowship in Houston with Dr. Bailey, uh, and Dr. Bailey was one of those people who just impressed you in how he never gave up on his patients and always tried to do that extra step uh, to make sure he got the best results and, and to fix patients that uh, others couldn't. Um, and that was really what attracted me to robotic surgery. It was both. It was the fact that I could get the speed back and you will get the speed back in a minimally invasive fashion robotically. But also with that uh, wrist motion and the ability to suture, uh, you can always uh, think what else can you do? How else can I improve my patient? How else can I address things that could not normally be addressed? Uh, how do I do this minimally invasive when I not nor normally may not? Uh, and so that's really the advantage of robotic surgery. Here now we're going to another video, which again shows the advantage of robotic surgery. So this is a uh, sacral copepexy there we see we're taking off infected mesh. 
that mesh had invaded the colon uh, and caused a vaginal colovaginal fistula. So here you can see uh, we're tying down the uh, vaginal opening uh, with some uh, vicral suture. After this point now we're blowing up the bladder here and what we're going to do is we're going to take a peritoneal bladder flap and throw that over the vaginal opening. Now normally I would take omentum but there was no uh, omentum for, in this patient. So again wanting to have an extra layer between my colon anastomosis and my vaginal opening uh, we decided to take the bladder down, the, you know, the peritoneum off of the bladder and just throw that over as, as an extra layer. So again it's, it's the idea is how do we improve our results uh, make it so that we're less likely to have a recurrence of a fistula and that's what we're thinking how to do here and and that's what we're doing again i apologize that all these videos are sped up but you know they only give me 20 minutes so i'm trying to get uh, a lot of learning in in that 20 minutes for you guys this video now is a uh a uh a nice procedure or we're taking the uh, colon out through the rectum there and you see how simple it is to do this now i'm just stapling across uh, the rectum that i just took the specimen out uh, i'll usually put my anvil up uh, through the rectum uh, and on and, and this video, it shows it a little differently. I do an end to side anastomosis. So uh, I'm just cleaning off that distal rectal stump for a better eventual anastomosis. And then what we see is we'll look at the uh, proximal bowel. And I just put a purse string suture in the proximal bowel here. And then I'll open up uh, a hole in the uh, proximal bowel right in the middle of the purse string suture and place my anvil inside and then tie it down. Uh, for anastomosis. Now this is not normally the way I do it and you'll see videos in a few seconds of what I usually do which is an end to end but there are some advantages to this if you have the length and and that is that you don't really have to clean off any mesentery or worry about any ticks uh, when you do your uh, uh, anastomosis here uh, because it's going to be the anti-mesenteric border uh, and it's also very easy to do. I make sure that my circular staple line is well away from my linear staple line so again I don't have to worry about any ischemia uh, to the bowel in between those two staple lines. I don't use that uh, that green spike anymore because I'm just putting it in. Here's the ICG test. Again I ICG everything with the excise since it's so easy to do and that does minimize complications. And now I'm just uh, doing my connection there uh, and, and then we'll do a leak test. Um, this patient uh, was an athlete and was very quickly uh, back on her feet and playing golf and tennis again. Um, so again, some of the, the nice advantages, and again, our hack scores and our surgical site infections are going to be down because we don't have any big incision. Uh, here's a video where I'm taking out the specimen through the vaginal opening, and now I place my anvil through that vaginal opening. And then when I do the ICG test here, I see that my distal bowel uh, is ischemic. So it's potentially preventing me from getting a leak because I've just uh, saw the ischemic distal bowel. Uh, I've also not had done an uh, uh, incision, so I'm not going to get a surgical site infection. Um, and now I take that extra little piece out through the 12 and then this is how I do my normal intracorporeal and I'll show you this in another video but probably a little slow down but it's just basically a uh, purse string suture in the proximal bowel. You can use any suture. I use Viacryl but you can use PDS or VLOC uh, depending on what you, what you prefer. Obviously if you use a VLOC don't pull down too tight or put the anvil in first. Now I just dunk the anvil in. I then uh, tighten up my suture. Again I no longer put that spike in as I don't need it and in, in the other video see that I don't have the spike in there. Uh, and then we just sort of tie down that uh, that uh, suture. Uh, once we've tied down the suture, uh, we'll then remove the needle and then I'll just have to close that vaginal opening. You can do that with a, a running uh, Stratifix or VLOC or you can uh, do it with some interrupted uh, vicryls. Uh, here I'm obviously cleaning off the proximal bowel. I was once worried about that but uh, actually I find it easier with the magnification to clean it off on the inside rather than the outside. Uh, so that doesn't worry me at all. Sometimes I'll throw a second suture around that spike if, if I think it's loose at all. Um, and, and the idea is, you know, good is the enemy of better. So I just try to uh, whittle it down enough so that I'm, I'm sure that I'll have a nice anastomosis without, uh, without the, any fat getting in the way of it. Um, so at this point now, um, I'm going to uh, start closing down my vaginal opening, you'll see. And again, with, in this case, I'm doing that with a bunch of uh, figure of eight sutures. Uh, I don't normally recommend taking things out through the vagina on uh, a left colectomy. I've done it on a right colectomy, for example, where I had a patient who had a huge fibroid uterus and she came into a full, came into the office with a foley and they said that the uterus was actually obstructing her urinary flow. Uh, so she was getting a, a TH, uh, in TLH BSO anyway, uh, but, uh, but um, I have done it in some cases 
uh, you know, with the cancer that we maybe think is going to the ovaries, and so they're getting a, a TLHBSO anyway. Um, but obviously, the reason why on most lefts I don't do it uh, is because of it more about a fistula forming. So after we've closed the vaginal opening, we just come up with the spike. Uh, then we connect the uh, uh, the proximal bowel, close it down. We do our leak test, and our leak test is uh, negative. Um, this next video is uh, uh, so it's a I'm coming out the distal bowel with a spike, and as I do that, I notice that the integrity of that uh, of that distal bowel uh, looks like it's not that great. I, I just don't like it, so I put an extra suture into the distal bowel there, right around the spike, and I just tie that tighter. Um, and I, so therefore I bring all bowel with, that sort of has more integrity, uh, stronger layer that's going to be in my staple line. So again, I'm trying to reduce the chance of a leak. So whether it's, you know, avoiding fistulas with peritoneal bladder flaps uh, or avoiding uh, 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 leaks from, from ICG showing me that there's not enough blood supply or repairing this distal spike, really what we're trying to do is we're just trying to get uh, better results. Uh, here's a, a case where I had to light up the ureter with ICG. You can see here an exploded sort of abscess uh, cancer on the ureter. Um, and so I'm actually operating the whole time here underneath ICG. Uh, and I'm sort of uh, peeling off that sort of abscess cavity slash uh, potential uh, cancer uh, from the ureter. I sort of, um, as you can see here, I pop into that cylindrical plane around the ureter. And in doing so, um, I realize obviously that it's not invading the ureter, and I'm able to just sort of peel it off. Uh, and mostly, it's it's without cautery. It's mostly just by uh, peeling that sort of tumor. Obviously, this is never going to be one of those cases that you're really happy with because it's an exploded uh, cancer and abscess cavity. But you know, in this situation, uh, we use the ICG to see the ureter, avoid an injury, and uh, didn't have to take the ureter at the same time and everything did come off very nicely. So again, using those advantages, ICG, uh, suturing on the inside, uh, you know, even your, your uh, thinking outside the box on, on how can I make my surgery better and reduce my chance of complications. And, and those are the kind of things that do lead to everyday practice, uh, your life being easier, less complications, less time spent rounding on your patients because they go home sooner. Um, and uh, everyone is just happier in general. Um, and this next case is we're using Firefly after a right colectomy, so there's a transverse colon in the small bowel. Uh, we light it up uh, with Firefly, so we see the transverse colon in the small bowel. Uh, it looks very good, but now the omentum just above there, well, that looks like that's dead, like we've devascularized the omentum. So that's an abscess waiting to happen, like a week or two after surgery. They'll come back in with an abscess right next to their new anastomosis, and we won't know, did we have a leak or what? It's a readmission, patient unhappy, possibly a drain, more expenses, uh, harder life. So again, you know, uh, doing the extra so that you can sleep at night and get better results, it does in the end uh, uh, lead to a better better. Uh, uh, quality of life for both you and your patient. Okay, in this next uh, patient, uh, I'm worried about the blood flow. Uh, it looks a little ischemic on ICG. Uh, I tested it beforehand and it was good, so I think it's just a spastic vessel. But what I decided to do is I decided to lembert the whole thing in uh, with some vicral sutures. Uh, just to be extra cautious. And then I know this, that the fatty appendage right next to it also has a good blood supply. So then I take that fatty appendage here, I check it, it all looks good now. Then I take the fatty appendage, I flip it over the top, and I put on a third layer. So again, um, you know, I'm sort of, I, I again thought it was probably okay, but I'm doing extra precautions uh, to make sure that this all turns out well, and it did turn out well for this patient. Um, the next uh, video is again, you know, we have that article by Wexner showing that we have better uh, anastomotic leak rates uh, when we do intracorporeal anastomoses. So what this uh, what this sort of shows is just it's just the sped up version of a uh, closure of a uh, uh, right colon uh, resection. Uh, the common enterotomy closure with a V-lock suture, and obviously it's sped up, and you guys can go to my YouTube site, uh, and you can see these videos not so fast, and, and it will uh, obviously uh, help as far as seeing each individual video. Um, but, you know, we do a, a interrupted running there, I'm sorry, running stitch there, and then a Lambert running back, 
Um, and then on top of that, we place the omentum. So again, the reason why I think we're having decreased uh, anastomotic leaks from like 4% to 1 point something percent on intracorporeals is because now it's good they have a grand patch, they have two layers in their closure. I put the grand patch over every uh, possible leak area. So again, that's why I think we're decreasing our leak rates. Here's a, a, a left intracorporeal. So this is to show what my assistant does. As you can see, he's putting the anvil in and he, all he undocked was the stapler port. And now he put the anvil in, puts the stapler port back on, immediately docks the robot again. He, you can see here he put the anvil in the pelvis on that, on that video screen. And then as soon as he's docked the robot, all he has to do is take that piercing towel clamp, put it right over my thing, and the period of a minute or two, I now have my anvil in there. Because I have the air seal, I still have good insufflation. And now I can address my um, intracorporeal on the left. Uh, again, I staple off uh, my proximal bowel and then I, so that I don't get any spillage. And then I just come and cut off my staple line. So here I'm cutting off my staple line. And after I, I I'll use uh, the cut uh, more than the coag here so I don't get quite as much spread. And then uh, after I've cut that, and, but when it does bleed on occasion, I will use the coag. And then after I sort of have that staple line cut off, I'll take out the, the extra piece of the staple line through the 12 port. And then again, I'll place a purse string suture in that proximal bowel. Uh, and then I will um, place my anvil in the proximal bowel and, and, uh, and tie it tight. So uh, there I have the proximal bowel open. You can see my anvil still sitting in the pelvis. Again, don't put it in the regular abdomen. You could lose it in the regular abdomen, but if it just sits in the pelvis, don't have to worry about losing it. Uh, my assistant brings the suture in, and now I just do a uh, running suture all the, all the way around that bowel. Um, and the idea again is that once I have that all the way around, I'll just place the anvil in and tie it down uh, tight. And sometimes I'll even throw a second suture around that if I need to. I like to start on the side towards me because that allows me when I place the anvil here uh, to have what I'm tying right behind me. I pull, pull it up with the, uh, I always put the uh, small grass retractor behind it so that the anvil won't fall down. I've never had it fall down the proximal bowel, but again, that small grass retractor there is preventing that from happening. Uh, he gave me a second suture there just in case I need it. Um, and now I'm again clearing off the fat of the proximal bowel uh, for a good anastomosis uh, to below. Again, here, uh, you know, uh, better is the enemy of good, but, uh, but uh, you know, we just try and thin it down enough so that we feel we'll have a nice, uh, good staple anastomosis. So at this point, I did decide to place a second suture. I don't do quite as many. I just do three or four uh, throws, and then I'll tie that down. And then again, that's nice and uh, taut so that... Uh, you know, when it when it goes to the uh, EA from below and starts to squeeze things out, it'll be t uh, tough enough to give me two good anastomotic rings. And there I'm cleaning off a little of the of the gut too, so that that doesn't get stuck in my uh, staple. And now I come up with the anvil from below, and very simply I just sort of attach it. And I like to push it on from behind, so you can see I'm pushing it on from behind. And right there we have a good anastomosis at this point. Other tricks I like to do, which is very hard to show in this video, is sometimes I'll tie the distal mesentery to the proximal mesentery, also to take off tension, uh, or, or um, but I, and I'll check it with ICG just to make sure it's good. This was a uh, double-layered suture anastomosis, which again is sped up, uh, obviously. Uh, so we've got a posterior silk layer, uh, then an internal vicral layer that goes all the way around and runs, and then an anterior silk layer. Uh, this was a segmental colectomy for Crohn's disease for a descending uh, colitis. Uh, so we couldn't get an EA up all the way from below. Couldn't even get a 25 up. Um, uh, but it's it's just nice because this, um, this would be very hard to do laparoscopically and a lot of people would have to open. Uh, but it was actually quite uh, easy to do robotically. So we just cut the entire anti-mesenteric border on both sides. Uh, that way it doesn't structure down. And once we've cut it open on both sides, I'll throw two 10 inch uh, vicral sutures right next to each other to form the posterior internal layer. Um, they'll be right next to each other and then I'll run them in opposite directions, in to out, out to in, uh, all the way around going in both directions. Uh, and then I'll tie them uh, on the anterior layer together. Uh, after that, I leave my uh, silk sutures uh, long uh, on both sides. So once I've gone all the way around and tied them together, 
I then know exactly where my original uh, uh, outer layer was uh, posteriorly and I can continue that uh, anteriorly. Um, I do like this anastomosis. It's a very strong anastomosis. Um, I'm pretty confident in it uh, um, once it's complete, but it does take uh, you know probably 20 minutes long or so. I don't use it uh, that often, um, but I have used it on several occasions. So here I'm now tying everything together and then afterwards I will uh, again do my uh, silk layer of anterior sutures and, and tie that down. Again, these videos are sped up uh, and you can see slower versions of them on my YouTube site. Going back to the team, because again, it's all about the team. Uh, this is now a nice little video snippet of my anesthesiologist uh, doing ERAS with my patient. Pre-op, got uh, Tylenol, Gabapentin, Interreg. Uh, we did some uh, interop, ketamine, uh, lidocaine, magnesium. Uh, really just sparing opioids, hopefully during surgery that will continue uh, post-op and uh, kind of uh, doing some goal-directed fluid therapy. So in conclusion, I've used my data, uh, my team, uh, the articles, and my videos to show you why we are getting fewer abscesses, fewer leaks, fewer recurrent fistulas, better cancer resections, quicker recovery, um, uh, just an easier, uh, easier life for us and the patients. So I really believe robotic surgery is better surgery. It leads to better care uh, and uh, better cancer resections and, and happier patients. Uh, for one final comment, I would encourage you to uh, persevere um, and what I mean by that is uh, the care is better in the long run and uh, there were many times where I thought about quitting I don't know if I was 40 or 50 cases in um, but at one point I thought hey you know I've given this a, a long enough shot I'm still not there maybe it's not me maybe it's the technology and of course I was on the essay at that point but um, I decided to persevere and uh, it was very shortly after that that uh, I turned the corner and uh, it became uh, very easy and, and there was no going back. So uh, please, uh, despite the uh, long learning curve, uh, do persevere and uh, you will be very happy in the end. Thank you.